This is a message from the ministry of Calvary Chapel, Santa Barbara. For more information about our church, please visit calvarysb.com. Well, good morning, everybody. So happy to see you out here. It's not uh, super early, but it's early enough on a Saturday morning, especially in light of the time change. Is it just me, or am I just get older and the time change hits me worse every year? I don't know. I I don't remember it being like that for me, but boy, the last few years, it just seems like it slaughters me. Anyway, coming back to feeling normal now. Okay, now, um, this is sort of the schedule for this morning. Uh, What we're going to do is I'm going to do a session here now. Uh, We'll take a few questions and such at the end of this session. And then we'll take like about a 15-minute break. And then after that 15-minute break, uh, we'll come back and have a second session. We'll have a few songs and then a a second session. And then we'll conclude with just some more questions and answers. I mean... It's 9.18 right now. I mean, I got to figure we'll be done before noon, maybe sometime between 11.30 and noon, something like that. But it's not like I'm on a strict schedule. It's just we'll get through these two sessions together here this morning. And uh, thank you to Pastor Drew for putting together all those refreshments and setting everything up about that. I hope... I hope you got some coffee. You get some later. I need all the help. A little caffeination helps the preacher there. Not that I need it, I'm plenty, but it's any assistance on behalf of that. So, and again, I do just want to say this is a little bit out of my wheelhouse, to use a phrase, because I'm not going to exposit a specific, you know, chapter or section in the scriptures. We're going to be talking about a lot of different passages this morning and really coming to understand the dimensions of Jesus' work for us on the cross. So, Father in heaven, thank you for another morning. Lord, I I can't get away from that verse in the book of Lamentations that reminds us your mercies are new every morning. And so it's a new morning. You have new mercies for us. Lord, we trust in those mercies today and we ask that by your mercy you send forth the Holy Spirit to speak in and through your word, Lord, and come and teach us and instruct us and guide us and mold us here this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Last night, we saw that after the fall, humanity was left in a terrible condition because of Adam's sin and all the repercussions that came from it. We saw that we were in trouble as human beings, as people, because of sin we inherited from Adam, sin we've chosen all of our own accord, and Sin that has been forced upon us by our environment and, and, uh, and by um, individuals in our life. We are left in a very troubled place. We are fallen human beings. And because of this, we need a deep work of transformation. And God has supplied that need for humanity in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, I just used a phrase that's actually very important. And I don't know if you've caught it in my preaching over the years, but that phrase is an important phrase, and I want you to think about it. The person and work of Jesus Christ. The person and work. What do we mean by that phrase? Well, the person of Jesus means who he is as the second person of the Godhead. He's God. The person of Jesus means who he is in the incarnation. That there was a point of time in God's redemptive plan when God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, added humanity to his deity. Again, it's so important that we always think of the incarnation as addition and not subtraction. Something wasn't subtracted from God the Son. Something was added to him, and that's his humanity. The person of Jesus also means who he is as the ascended and returning one. This is the person 
of Jesus Christ. But then we also talk about the person and work of Jesus. When you think of the work of Jesus in its entirety, you first of all think about his work before the incarnation. Jesus was not sitting idle in heaven before he came as a babe at Bethlehem, but several times in the scriptures we see his work before the incarnation. The work of Jesus also includes his sinless, perfect, identifying life. Please don't think that the work of Jesus to save sinners, to save fallen humanity, please don't think that that work began on the Via Della Rosa. Don't think that it began when he went to the cross. But all throughout his human existence, Jesus was identifying with lost humanity. Jesus was there, um, um, uh, being there in his perfect sinless life, living the life that would justify us. The work of Jesus also means all of his teaching all of his training. The the work of Jesus especially means the work on the cross, what he accomplished through the empty tomb, which he himself says, why do we put so much emphasis on what Jesus did on the cross and the empty tomb for us? Because Jesus himself put that emphasis on it. When you read the Gospels, you see that Jesus himself has a focus on the work he will do at the cross and in his resurrection. What I'm trying to get at is when we talk about the person and work of Jesus, we mean everything that he is and everything that he did, but especially his work on the cross and the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And in all of this, there is transforming power for the one who believes and receives. The one who believes and receives receives transforming power from the person and work of Jesus, in particular, his work on the cross. Because that's the focus, not only of Jesus' life and ministry, but also of the apostolic first century church as they preached and communicated the person and work of Jesus. They had an emphasis on his work on the cross. Now, if you've heard a preacher such as myself, such as Pastor Tommy, Um, such as many other people who love God's word and love to faithfully proclaim the gospel. But I'll just speak for myself. You, You may have heard me present this message in a way that goes something like this. Uh, You and I are guilty sinners. Jesus Christ was sinless and completely innocent. Guilty, innocent. And what happened at the cross is that Jesus, the innocent one, went to the cross, and on the cross, he bore the guilt, he he bore the penalty, he bore the punishment that my sin deserved, so that that guilt, punishment, penalty, would not rest upon me, but it rested upon him, and now I'm declared not only not guilty before God, because Jesus took my punishment, my guilt, Not only am I declared not guilty, but I'm actually declared righteous before God. In other words, a guilty is a negative, innocent is a zero, righteous is a plus. And Jesus doesn't just take me from negative to zero, he takes me from negative to zero to plus, and a big, big, big plus, the righteousness of God. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but Does that sound familiar as an explanation of the person and work of Jesus? Just what he did on the cross. He took my guilt, and and because whereas before I would have been judged guilty in God's courtroom, because you know what? I am guilty. Now, because of the person and work of Jesus, it's as if in God's court, the son approaches the father, the judge, and he says, Father, all his guilt and penalty has been placed on me. I'll take it. Let him go free and credit to him my own righteousness. Does that sound familiar? No. All of that is true. It's very true. But this is what I want you to understand. As we saw from last night, the problem of mankind is so complicated, is so deep, is so much worse than what I just described to you there as me being guilty, that the work of Jesus does so much more than rescue me from my guilt 
and penalty in God's law court. And this is what we're going to talk about here. Now, is it true that the work of Jesus rescues me from the guilt and penalty of God's law court? Absolutely, positively. But we shouldn't think that God's work of transformation and rescue in Jesus Christ ends there. Not at all. So let's talk about some of the other dimensions of Jesus' work on the cross. And when I say some, I do not give what we study here this morning as an exhaustive list. I'm sure we could find a lot more if, if we just took the time to develop it. But these are just things that come to my mind and my heart quickly. Not only do we go from guilty to righteous, but we also go, look at this first point, from shame to honor. One of the beautiful things about the work of Jesus Christ is that it has relevance and transformation for every culture, every generation, every part of the world. It's not just limited to the world of the West in the 21st century. Now, it does apply to the world of the West in the 21st century. I don't mean to to diminish that at all. But it's so much greater than that that it has a profound transforming work in all these different cultures, in all these different times and places. Now, Western culture in the 21st century is not particularly shame and honor based. Sometimes I wonder if we have a sense of shame at all in Western culture in the 21st century. But let me tell you, it's not like that everywhere else in the world. There are other cultures that one of the most powerful factors in that culture is the dynamic of shame and honor. And the person who has shamed their family, shamed their community, they are lost, they are excluded, they are pushed out of the community, they may be abused, they may be murdered. You're familiar with the term honor killing? That's where this comes from. The idea that you've shamed your family. And brothers and sisters, I'm telling you that the way that it works in these shame and honor cultures is you can shame your family by something that's been done to you. You didn't even do it. For example, and I don't mean to be too graphic with this. Forgive me if it sounds a little bit too graphic. But in some of these shame and honor cultures, if a woman is raped, she's dishonored her family, her community, and she'll be murdered in an honor killing. It's unbelievable. But this shows how powerful the concepts of shame and honor are in these particular cultures. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you that in this idea of what Jesus did on the cross, not only does it apply to the concept of guilt and righteousness, but it also takes us from shame to honor. Jesus lifts people to honor. I love these verses. Romans chapter 10 verse 11 says, For the scripture says, Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Jesus takes that person. You know what he says? He says, listen, I just didn't bear your guilt at the cross. I bore your shame. I bore the shame that you pursued. I bore the shame that you chose. I bore the shame that was placed upon you unwillingly. I bore it all at the cross. And when we think of Jesus there on the cross, we think not only was it physically painful, but it was a shameful thing that was done to Jesus. The way that the Romans engineered the torture of the cross, it was deliberately intended to heap as much shame upon the individual as possible. That's why they put the crucified individual on the cross completely naked. Now, by the way, I mean, I know in our artistic depictions of Jesus on the cross, and I believe properly so, We depict him with a loincloth. I just want you to know that's not how it looked at the cross. And why would they put somebody up there completely naked, offending the ideals of of, of the, the, the somewhat conservative, morally Jewish society around them? Because they wanted to shame that person on the cross. They wanted them to be humiliated. But Jesus said, I'll bear it all. I'll take the shame. I'll take your shame and I'll give you my honor. Because is there anybody more honored than Jesus Christ himself? That's why I love what Jesus says in John chapter 12, verse 26. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Do you see Jesus opens up wide the gates of honor 
to anybody who will come and follow him. My Father will honor you. What a beautiful, powerful thought. Now, can you see what a wonderful message this is of what Jesus did on the cross to somebody who feels that they have shamed their family, shamed their community, shamed themselves, and now Jesus says, I'll set you free from that and I'll lift you to a place of honor. That's one of the dimensions of what Jesus did on the cross. Let's look at another one. Jesus takes us from fear to power. We were harassed and attacked by hostile demonic powers. Jesus triumphed over those demonic powers at the cross. Jesus is our protector. Now again, I'm talking about something that maybe not has enough or so much relevance to the Western world of the 21st century. But do you realize how many um, native and aboriginal cultures around the world they live in deathly fear of spiritual powers that exist out in a hostile world. You and I as believers and with the biblical knowledge, we would understand that to be demonic powers, but they may not have the vocabulary for that. They just know that there are spirits out there in the world that mean them harm. And they live in great fear of these spirits that would damage themselves and their family and their community. Their life is bound up in this great, great fear. And the message of the gospel is this, is that Jesus Christ triumphed over those spirits at the cross. Look at what it says here in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. It says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. And then again, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, we read, which he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. Those words, both in Colossians chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 1, principalities and powers, that's New Testament vocabulary for demonic spirits, demonic powers that would oppose the people of God and the work of God in this world. And what Jesus did on the cross was a triumph over them. And again, what a powerful message this is. It, it may not resonate so much with 21st century Western world, but to go to so many parts of the world and say, you don't have to live under the power of this demonic fear anymore. The spirits that you think inhabit your world, they have been brought under subjection to Jesus Christ and his great work on the cross. He disarmed those powers and he's enthroned above them and triumphs above them. That is a beautiful and powerful message. And it's another aspect of Jesus' work on the cross that goes far beyond well, beyond isn't the right word because I don't want to act as if it's greater or, or, or you know, uh, at a further distance than the work of relieving us from our guilt and giving us the righteousness. It doesn't go beyond the picture of the law, but it's added to it. It makes the work of Jesus greater and greater. Here's another idea from um, the, the concept of Jesus' work on the cross. Where it takes us from defiled to clean we were dirty and damaged by what was done against us and Jesus bore our curse and defilement in his life at the cross Jesus cleanses and restores now this is a little bit different from the idea of shame and dishonor because this idea of being defiled and dirty it doesn't necessarily come from the community around us this comes from within the same the, the person. The person who feels that what they have done makes them dirty and defiled before God. Again, I wonder how much relevance this has to a culture that we live in that seems to be almost dead to the concepts of spiritual defilement, of, of, of spiritual impurity, of, of moral impurity. We seem to be dead and insensitive to that. But do you understand? Think about how many religions of the world have some kind of ceremonial washing? Think of how intrinsic that is. Think of the Hindu bathing in the Ganges, which I understand isn't a particular clean river, 
But they understand that as having some, what are they seeking that cleansing for? What is this all about? It comes back to something very deep within the human condition that says, I am dirty. My sin has defiled me. I need to be cleansed. And do you see what Jesus does through his own person and work? I love what he does. Look at this as it's expressed in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. It says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now notice two things. First of all, the wonderful promise of cleansing from all sin. I love how John phrased it. What a beautiful thing that is. Did it say some sin, a few sins, all sin? That's what I need. I need something that will cleanse me from all sin. But notice that. What is it that cleanses? It's the blood of Christ. And when we talk about that term, the blood of Christ, we understand that, again, this is New Testament terminology meant to refer to the work of Jesus on the cross in a powerful and picturesque way. It's not as if the actual physical blood of Jesus could save somebody. I imagine, and I know it's, it's, it's a little bit disgusting to think of it in these terms, but think of a Roman soldier with one of these great big nails, a little bit more like a railroad spike than, you know, a, a nail, a framing nail. He stands there over the wrist of Jesus. He has a hammer in his hand. And with a few well-practiced blows, because he's done it so often, He hammers that spike through the wrist of Jesus. And blood splatters back up on him. He's been splattered by the blood of Jesus, literally. Does that mean his sins are forgiven? Does that mean he's washed? No. We're not talking about a superstitious application of the physical blood of Jesus. We're not talking about something that would feed in to the superstitious ideas that in medieval cathedrals there's a vial with a few drops from the actual blood of Jesus. We're not talking about crazy superstitions and legends like that. No, what we're talking about is the very real death of Jesus of Nazareth on an afternoon right outside the city walls of Jerusalem where he died for the sins of humanity not for his own sins that is how we are made clean that is how a person can come and say I am no longer dirty before God in my own conscience I am clean here's another verse that speaks to that I love this from Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 he says and from Jesus Christ the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us and washed us from our own sins in his own blood. Now what's interesting about that is if you kind of take, you know, the Christian New Testament environment from that, you read that phrase, you go, how gross. Washed in the blood? It sounds disgusting. But friends, when we understand what the Bible means and what the, the import and the, 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 the poetic, I should say, grandeur in that, To be made clean by the work of Jesus on my behalf, I don't have to go around thinking I'm dirty. You know, you wonder how much psychological pressure, stress is placed upon people from this sense that they have, I'm dirty. I don't belong. Jesus Christ came to set us free from that. And it's his work on the cross that does it. Well, let's go to a further aspect. The work of Jesus on the cross means we go from lost to belonging. We were lost in a strange and hostile world. And through his work on the cross, Jesus reconciles us to God and to one another Jesus rescues us. Last night, when we were going through some of the ways that that the fallen condition of humanity is described, and all we could do is go through some of them, but one of the ones that we talked about, 
And I got to say, my own heart touched was deeply touched, even as I was preaching about it last night, to talk about humanity being lost. And I just have that picture of, of the sorrow, of, of the pitiful nature of the child who's lost. And you think about the child who gets lost, you know, there in the department store. Well, is the child the perpetrator of the being lost? Yes. They wandered off. They weren't paying attention. They should have, you know, we're not talking about parents who ditched the child in the department store, though if that ever happened to you, I'm very sorry about that. But no, we're, we're talking about the child who just kind of wanders off. And on the one hand, you could say it's their fault, and it is their fault. But on the other hand, who's there shaking an angry finger in the face of the child? Your heart is moved with pity, with compassion. You just feel this, you're lost, you're lost. And what can be done for you? This is what Jesus says. Jesus says, I will come and reconcile you. I will take you from lost to belonging. You belong, you have a place among the people of God. Check this out in Ephesians chapter two, verses 17, 18, and 19. I love this passage, it says this. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off, There you were, you were far off, you were lost. He came and preached peace to you and to those who were near. And through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. You were once lost and wandering. You felt like you didn't belong anywhere, that you had no place, you had no community. And what does the work of Jesus says? I have come and you have a place among the people of God. Or I like this one from Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. It says, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled, notice this, in the body of his flesh through death. What's that talking about? His work on the cross. To present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Once you were alien enemies, you were lost. You were gone. You were distant. But God has deliberately, through the work of Jesus, brought you close, drawn you near. That's interesting. I don't know if in 21st century Western culture, if the idea of shame and honor has as much relevance as this one does, you can tell we, we are a lost generation. People sense it. People wonder where they're going. Their life seems aimless and purposeless. Jesus Christ, through his work on the cross, comes and he says, you who were alienated, I will bring you close. Then the next one, a fifth one that we'll look at, Jesus brings us from chaos to order. We live in chaos and disorder from sin and all of its effect, and Jesus sets things in order through his victory over darkness. Jesus brings order. Now please understand this. We may feel distant from this in our present culture, But in many parts of the world, life is chaotic and very unpredictable. You you should thank God that we in the Western world live as an inheritance of almost 2,000 years of Christian culture that's done so much to shape the world and the order of the world around us. We benefit from that greatly. Although it's kind of so tragic today. It's not kind of tragic. It is tragic. In the great rejection of God, and, and, and Christian understanding today, you see that Western culture is just sort of uh, destroying the very foundation that it's built upon. And it can't last much longer. The, the more we reject the gospel and Christianity and God's Genesis, you're going to see that chaos increase. And it gives us a greater fervor to do whatever we can to be salt and light. But understand this. Jesus brings order. I love what it says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. What a beautiful idea. He's taking us from this place of chaos and danger and disorder and brought us into a kingdom. I like this one even better. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. And by Him to reconcile all things to Himself 
whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. That idea of reconciling all things to himself, I love the idea behind that in the original language. The idea behind that is to sum up or resolve as in an, an I was going to, what's the word I'm looking for? Mathematical, arithmetic, uh, like a math problem. Solving it all. He's reconciled it. He's taken this complex math problem and he's worked it out. He's taken something from chaos and unsolvable and disordered to order. How many lives around us do we see marked by this? Their lives are just filled with chaos. They need the order of Jesus Christ. Now, just as much as you would take a person who is burdened by guilt and the fear and the stain of sin on their life, you would consciously bring them to the cross, you can do the same thing for the person whose life is filled with chaos, whose life is filled with shame, whose life is filled with the idea of them being stained. The the answer for these things is resolved at the cross. Here's another aspect. I think we've got four more of these that we'll talk about here this morning. And I don't want to say that it's limited to the list I'm giving you here this morning. We could go on and talk about further dimensions of the work of Jesus on the cross. But another way that it takes us is it takes us from despair to hope. We live in despair because of sin and all its effects. And Jesus conquered despair by his death and resurrection. Jesus brings hope. Isn't that a beautiful message? And it's true. If there was anything that ever seemed hopeless on this earth, it was Jesus on the cross. Can you just imagine what that was like for the spectators? Jesus' disciples had forsaken him, except for the apostle John who wandered up to the cross and stood beside Mary, his mother. There's a few women there. There, There's mocking religious leaders. There's cold-hearted Roman soldiers. But I think of the few women... And the one disciple, John himself, standing there at the cross. And I can't imagine a greater degree of hopelessness that ever filled a human heart than that. Everything they had ever hoped for seemed absolutely destroyed right before them at the moment. There was no hope seemingly there. And as Jesus said, take all of that hopelessness and put it on me. And I'll give you the greatest hope that's ever been seen in humanity. I'm going to rise from the dead. Now I'm going to show you not only hope, I'm going to show you a hope that cannot be defeated. I love how Hebrews chapter 7 verse 19 puts it. It says, for the law made nothing perfect, but on the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. This is the gift to us in Jesus Christ. Hope. Hope for a world that seems to be full of despair. Or in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There again, we have that focus on what Jesus did at the cross and the empty tomb. Hope doesn't come. <laughs> oh, listen, hope doesn't come from the inspiring example of Jesus' life. Now, we gain a lot from the inspiring example of Jesus' life. But to hear this message, Jesus lived like this, now you go out and live that same way, I'll be honest with you, for me, that's a pretty hopeless message. Because what does it leave me with? I can't. I read what Jesus did in the gospel. I can't do that. And it's not like I can't just do the miracle stuff. Okay, yeah, I can't do the miracle stuff. But you know what? I can't love the way that he did. I, 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 can't, I can't be courageous the way that he did. I can't be compassionate the way that he did. So to hold that up and this is your hope. No, that's not my hope. What is my hope is what he did for me on the cross and to realize that with Christ in me, the hope of glory, now, now, I can follow him in some way. But to merely hold him up as an example, that's not hope. 
but the hope is found in what he did for me at the cross. And of course, he did it for you as well. It also moves us from slavery to freedom. We were born into slavery to the world, the flesh, and the devil. Jesus defeated those powers at the cross. Jesus sets us free. And you know, I've been talking about these different dimensions of the cross and those that have greater uh, relevance to different cultures and different places. But this is one of these ones that's universal to humanity. Every person who's ever walked this earth has some understanding of what it means to be a slave to sin. You don't think you're a slave to sin? Or you have been a slave to sin? No, I'm not a slave to sin. I can imagine somebody who has yet to give their life to Jesus Christ and they protest. Well, I'm not a slave to sin. I can do whatever I want to do. I'm not a slave to sin. Okay, then show me you're not a slave to sin. Stop sinning. And suddenly you realize, I have this slavery to sin. I need it broken. Who can break my slavery to sin? Listen, Jesus Christ says it. Look at what it says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13, through, uh, 13 and 14. He says, he's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the, son, the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins. Again, notice, and I don't know if you've ever alerted your eyes to look at this when you read the New Testament. Look at the emphasis on the blood. And when you see that phrase, the blood, don't think of a blood bank. Don't think of them withdrawing blood from you from a blood test. Think of the work of Jesus on the cross. Back to that again and again. And what has he done? He set us free. He's given us a freedom from our slavery to sin. We were born in that slavery, but now set free. Another one is, another dimension of the cross is that he's transported us from death to life. We were dead in our sins. And Jesus defeated death at the cross and through the empty tomb, Jesus brings life. Now, I'm gonna get just a little bit theological with you for a moment. Because this touches on something that's pretty important in a big theological picture. There is a um, approach to understanding Jesus' work in us and the lost human condition that emphasizes, and I would say overemphasizes this idea of that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. You say, well, how can it be overemphasized if the scriptures clearly state it? And of course, the scriptures do clearly state it several times that we were dead in our trespasses and sins and that we need new life in Jesus Christ. I think that error that this approach in theology makes is it says that it focuses on this as if it was the only description of lost humanity instead of it seeing being one among many what have we looked at tonight and today (laughs) 10 15 different descriptions of lost humanity are we dead in trespasses and sins yes That's one picture that describes our state. But we're also lost. We're also blind. We're also slaves. We're also enemies. We're also sinners. And I mean, I could just keep going down the list. But just what I want you to understand is, is that dead is one description among many describing the state of men and women apart from Jesus Christ. Now, if dead is overemphasized and treated as if it's the only valid description, and it says everything that there is to say about lost humanity, then I believe you can run into this trouble of believing that a person has to be born again before they believe. 
And without going into the, the intricacies of it, I think that when you look at the New Testament, the very natural understanding of the stating of the, the New Testament is a person believes and they're born again. They believe and they're born again. Now, can a person believe without a prior work done in them by Jesus Christ? Never, never. Jesus said it so plainly. He said, nobody comes to me except the Father draws him. The Bible makes it so plain that it is impossible for any man or woman to come to Jesus unless God does a prior work in them. A person cannot just of their own initiative, of their own volition, just decide, I'm going to put my faith in Jesus Christ. You cannot do that unless God has done a prior work in you. I would just say that that prior work that God does in that person is not the same as their being born again, regenerated. Because the natural phrasing and stating of this process throughout the New Testament is, we believe and we're born again. We believe and we're born again. But is it true that men and women are dead in trespasses and sins apart from the work of Jesus Christ? Absolutely it's true. Jesus defeated death at the cross and through the empty tomb, Jesus brings life. That's why we see verses like this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Or Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ. In God, I should say. We were dead in trespasses and sin. And Jesus Christ brings us new life. Again, it's all done through the person and work of Jesus, especially focused in his work on the cross. Now, finally, and this is the last dimension that I'll explore with you. I don't mean for a moment that this exhausts the dimensions of Jesus' work on the cross. But finally, we see that the work of Jesus on the cross takes us from guilt to innocence. We were guilty and needed to be forgiven, and Jesus is the one who took our guilt upon himself. Jesus forgives us. Notice this from Colossians chapter 2. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Don't you just love that picture? That Paul takes us to the courtroom, and here's the handwriting of the accusations against you and I. And there it is. It's listing out our sins, the, the, the sins we've committed, the sins we've cherished in our hearts, the sins we wished we could have committed but never had the opportunity, all of our sins and failings before God. It's written all out there. And you take one look at that and your first reaction is, I sure hope nobody ever sees this writing of handwriting that's against me. It's just filled with shame and the guilt. You, I'm guilty. Look at this. I can't beat this rap. And it's as if, if you want to make the uh, courtroom analogy a little spicier, think of the devil as being the prosecuting attorney. The Bible says he's the accuser of the brethren, doesn't he? And he comes forward and he holds up that handwriting requirements. And he says, judge, if you want to use the picture, the analogy we're kind of drawing, the judge is God the Father. Judge, this person is utterly guilty. Guilty of everything on this handwriting requirements. And what can we say? It's true. It's all true. We have no explanation. It's all true. And what Jesus, our advocate, does he comes up to the bench. He asks, may I approach the bench, your honor? He walks forward to the judge and he says, dad, because you know, he's the son of God. Dad, this one's with me. And he takes that handwriting of requirements and he takes it over to the cross and he nails it to the cross. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that beautiful? We were guilty sinners 
And Jesus Christ has won our pardon even while we were guilty. He didn't get us off by some trick. But no, we were pardoned because Jesus took our punishment. One other verse, Romans chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Or if by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Again, back to the courtroom, and that's what Jesus did for us. Now, I ended on the idea of Jesus taking us from guilt to innocence. Because it is a wonderful and powerful dimension of what Jesus did on the cross. But what I hope to under, make you understand here this morning is, is that the only dimension to what Jesus did on the cross? Not by a long stretch. And so we never want to ignore it because it's scriptural truth and even has a beautiful emphasis in the New Testament that Jesus Christ takes us from guilty to innocent. But that does not describe the fullness of the dimension of Jesus' work for us on the cross by a long stretch. And so without hesitation, without any kind of, of checking ourselves, we can come and we could come to the person who's filled with shame and say, Jesus Christ will take you from shame to honor. We can come to that person whose life is filled as if they, they, they have this feel that demonic and dark spiritual powers are set against them and they live their life in fear of those things and say, no, Jesus Christ can take you from this fear and give you the power of knowing that he's overcome all that. We can talk to the person who feels defiled and dirty and tell them how Jesus makes them clean from loss to belonging, from chaos to order, from despair to hope, from slavery to freedom, from death to life. This, this begins to discuss the dimensions of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. You see, the picture of how far and how hard we fell is so shocking. We need a work for us in the person and work of Jesus Christ that has many, many dimensions. And that's what he's given to us in Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let's take time out, just maybe five minutes for a few questions. And then, uh, and then we'll take a break and come back for a second session. Questions. See a few hands here. Marco, I'm sorry, I can't hear it yet. Are, are we on up there? All right, brother, while they're figuring it out, just say it loud. <laughs> Please.
Yes. It would seem not. And let me repeat the question. Will there be any more need for faith when we're right there in front of our creator? It would seem no, that there will be no more need for faith. And it seems like that is exactly Paul's point in 1 Corinthians 13. That the need for faith will be no more in heaven. The need for hope will be no more in heaven. Those are all forward-looking things for things that we don't yet possess or not in their fullness. But the need and the presence of love will endure throughout all eternity. And it fits in perfectly with what Paul's saying there in 1 Corinthians 13, really highlighting the supremacy of love. Yeah, great question. Yes, Hello. But I believe that it's Yes. Well, again, I think how you can do, I mean, you use the the analogy of the courtroom and all of that. I think you can use the analogy of how shame works, particularly in a family or a community, especially the dynamic of shame coming upon a person, maybe even for things they didn't even do, but the things that were done to them and to show how Jesus took that shame. And, And, you know... It's, it's a very powerful picture to understand the depths of the shame and degradation that Jesus endured on the cross and how he, he but not just in the negative, just as much as we, when we talk about the guilt and innocence picture, we don't want to um, emphasize the removal of guilt to the neglect of the receiving of righteousness Neither do we want to emphasize the removal of shame to the neglect of the bestowal of honor because that's what we have in Jesus. Yes, exactly. Not zero, but plus. Yes. Yeah. And Jesus' identification with that throughout his ministry, in his birth, in his um, baptism, in so many places identifying with that. Okay, a few more. Uh, Pastor David, you said many times that it seems like it's all uh, believe to reborn, believe to reborn, but then you quickly said no, something has to be done by the Father. Yes. But then I... I'm led to believe that that's going to be coming later. In other words, you didn't tell us what something has to be done by the Father. Well, that's right. I I think I'm going to deal with that in the next session. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, in the next session, we're going to talk about what actually happens kind of on the inside when a person's born again. Yeah, so I think we'll work through that. But if not, we'll hit with the question after. Yes. 
So assuming the nature of man hasn't changed before and after Christ was here, what was the condition in relation to God and where did you know, they go? Is there any hope for all the people before Christ came? Well, it's getting into a question that was raised last night and it's making me feel like, man, maybe we'll do the next Enduring Word weekend talking about some of these critical issues. And the, the issue is, what about those who have never heard? What about those who have never heard? And, and that's a question that not only applies to those before Jesus and his work, um, but no, there, there were people who were followers of Yahweh, people who were in right relationship with God apart from Israel. Uh, two examples that come immediately to mind were Melchizedek, of course, he was pre-Israel, but in Abraham's time. Another one is Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. These were people who were accounted righteous uh, apart from, you know, kind of the Abrahamic line. Uh, another one, probably, it seems like he wasn't in the Abrahamic line, I can't say for certain, is Job. So it seems that God has a way to reach and connect the, with those people, um, but they don't have the fullness of what God has given to us in Jesus Christ, either in the preview of it, the announcement, or the fulfillment of it. It seems to me like maybe that's going to be the, a big topic on our next Enduring Word weekend. What about those who've never heard? Would you agree, David, that um, Christ completed its work taking us from dead and sins and trespasses to honor and righteousness because of who Jesus Christ is, it would have to go all the way in the fullness of receiving that righteousness just because he's the one that paid the price. So in, in essence, not only do I forgive you and pay your debt, but theologically, we would have to come to that status of being completely righteous because of who he is and us being in him. Yeah, Jesus doesn't give a halfway righteousness. It's full and complete in him, absolutely. This is a message from the ministry of Calvary Chapel Santa Barbara. For more information about our church, please visit calvarysb.com.